take me back to the start. Where did this all come from? Because it's a personal piece for you. Yeah, it is. I mean, it came actually through um, Kudos, who um, were uh, suggesting something to do with um, this sort of music. And it struck a chord with me, literally, because this was, you know, the era when I grew up and um, I had experienced, uh, you know, from similar places to that and remembering at the time it seemed completely normal it wasn't like oh my god what's going on but when you look back there was a period when um in coventry and then birmingham when a certain sort of music appeared and people who were completely opposite in terms of race and and, and obviously they weren't opposite but they were only opposite in terms of race but suddenly everybody came together so you go to a, like a birmingham football match and after the match You'd go to a pub and somebody would turn up with a record player, plug it in and put this music on and everybody was just united. So the point being that it wasn't deliberate or forced or anybody said you should do this or or anybody at the time said, this is good. You know, it wasn't that. It just happened. And I just thought um, it would be interesting to tell a story set then where, and what I tried not to do is say, let's tell a story of four people who form a band. It's let's tell a story of four people in very very difficult circumstances who have no, who can only escape if they become famous so that's the sort of the agenda that i set for for the story because music is such a force of hope and positivity isn't it for so many of us especially at that time in your life absolutely and, and what's great about it is that it sort of comes from nowhere i think i think it, it appeals to some part of whatever one's psyche is that isn't rational or reasonable and that's what i've tried to do with this i mean they're so brilliant these actors but the, the idea that they're not seeking it out they're not trying to find it this thing is finding them and it's giving them something um that's different and and trying not to make it you know a message or a force it's just like the, and a lot of it a lot of the character stuff is based on real people as well you know the, the um um, the character of Gregory is based on a real person. So trying to get these things in where, in reality, stuff that you wouldn't normally do in fiction is real. You know, there's this, he's joined the army and he's doing the stuff he's doing in the army, then he comes back and does this other stuff. Trying to get the reality and the, the grittiness, not grittiness, but the unusualness of reality into the story. Given your passion then, is it is it hard to take a step back and write it down? Was it challenging? No, no, it's it's easier i think it's a bit like music for me it's a bit like music it's like sitting there and just doing it and trying not to think about it too much uh is the best way for me to do it and the setting is so vital to this and and the point being and paul has done such a brilliant job of, 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 of the point being that here is this you know this council estate two council estates and you could approach it and say oh isn't it a shame there's poor people and it isn't you know people people there you don't think like that and it's brilliant it's glamorous and it's dramatic so the idea is that the blocks and the council says look beautiful and all these influences and sounds come together to make this really unique I, I think so yeah and I, I think we've been so fortunate with our performers our director and, and everything and, and people who are contributing the music so for me I've I am really excited about this and seeing that. And then you wait, you know, there's five more. And by the time you get to six, you're on, it's on fire. You know? Paul, tell me about how you got involved and, and whether it kind of sparked a, a vision in you instantly. Um, so I first read Steve's scripts, um, getting on for a couple of years ago now. And um, I know it sounds a cliche, but it's genuinely one of the best pieces the script I've ever read I mean it really leapt off the page the kind of the energy of it and the vitality of these characters and um and also it's both I, I think it's really interesting that it's a very personal piece for Steve um because actually it feels very it felt very personal to me you know actually the more personal you make something in the writing of it the more universal it becomes and so all the themes of being of that age of you know being a teenager and and that search for identity, who am I? Who's my tribe? You know, um, and expressing that through the music you listen to and the clothes that you wear, that's something that we could all relate to. I mean, I, I had a particular sort of nostalgia for it because I remember that time, and I'm from the Midlands as well, and and that place. So there's a sort of nostalgic element to it, but it's also universal thematically. You could set this story 
at any stage in history since the invention of the teenager. So it really <laughs> kind of um, spoke to me in that way. And I think what's interesting that in terms of the relationships that we all formed, everybody came to it with a very, very personal connection. Very, it was really personal. To, and that's on both sides of the camera. And how do you recreate those locations at that set time when so many people watching will know exactly what they're looking for and <laughs> be quite picky about it? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, um, I mean, Birmingham sort of offers a lot in terms of those those kind of estates that are there that you can go into, and they were actually very welcoming to us. I mean, if you if you say that you're working with a guy who created Peaky Blinders, then a lot of doors open Red for carpet. you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, um, so that was a definite advantage. Uh, the Brummies are rightly very proud of, of proud of that show, and um, so we were going onto onto estates and and and. and I mean, sadly, and not some of them haven't changed a lot in in forty years. Is is the reality of it? And um, and the truth is that, you know, other than satellite dishes, you know, that, that you can remove digitally later on, they're very very much as they were back in the eighties. And um, but as I say, we were welcomed into those places, and um, and we wanted something that was kind of expansive and, and beautiful as well as, as Steve said that actually the sun shines on these places and uh, and we found an area called Druid's Heath in Birmingham which is our Birmingham location which is a sort of sprawling estate with green spaces and woodland and then something in Coventry that we wanted it to be a little bit more insular a little bit more inward looking in terms of the bard name and story so we had that incredible estate which has a a large tower block in the, in the center of it and four kind of low rise blocks around each side of it which felt like a fortress so we had these two very distinctive different locations for birmingham and coventry and the soundtrack for this has got to be good and it is good so mm -hmm. talk to me about you know the pre pressure to to select those tracks and, and how you went about that uh well steve had written a lot of stuff in into the script so actually reading the script and with a playlist you know playing in, in your head really sort of brought a lot of that to life and uh, and we did a w lot of work in the edit in terms of experimenting with different tracks and, and really not wanting it to become, now that's what I call 1981, you know, to actually <laughs> really interrogate every music choice about why this track, why now, why here, why now. Um, and then we have a brilliant composer, Cor I don't know if Cormac is here tonight actually. Are you here? There he is. There he is. There's our fantastic, fantastic composer who wrote all the original music uh, for the show, uh, and sort of brought all the, the the sort of the style of that that time together with something that kind of felt feels very contemporary as well. Did you lose sleep thinking, Stephen? Oh God, I didn't get this song in. Or, you know, no, I've I've really tried not to to think about this in terms of it's got to be about music or have a forensic analysis of what music said, or even worse, try and be pure about things because as you know. At the time, with people listening to music, no one cared. People would listen to lots of different things. It's not like you you, you ghettoise it at all. So no, I wanted it. To, you know, which is why I wanted Leonard Cohen in there. You know, it's just the last thing you're expecting um, for a reason. Levi, congratulations, brilliant performance. Dan Tay's this dreamer, this poet who but who knows his own mind. I mean, what what were your first impressions of him? Um, I think the first thing that came to me was fear. <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of how 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 on earth am I going to do this? I actually, when I first read the script, I was kind of looking at Gregory like, oh, actually, he looks <laughs> he looks fun. So <laughs> 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 I, I have to. Uh, yeah, um, but yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, um, I think the, the, initially I was like, this guy is, he's instinctive, he's not, cal uh, he's not calculated. So I think I, I, I went in with that, you know, um, instinctiveness and just think about it as little as possible. Like, why is he doing this? Why is he saying this now? Don't think about it. Just, <laughs> just, just go with it. Just worship steve's script like it's the bible and just <laughs> just literally do whatever he tells you to do were you not endeared by him being such a romantic with dante yeah do you, do you think it's romantic 
Well, he's with her, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, I suppose. I'm still in his head. He's, he's like, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, he, I suppose, yeah, I, I think, I think it's the, the fact that he can go from, what was really intriguing was the fact that he can actually go from being in front of a gangster, the most dangerous gangster in Birmingham, allegedly, and then, um, and then just go and see the girl he fancies and just completely like just switch from moment to moment. And I think, yeah, I suppose he is, he is quite romantic because he goes the extra mile and he does things a bit differently. You know, he can't, he can't, he can't express the way he feels. I don't think, um, unless it's for a song or poetry. And he's got these beautiful lines to deliver, which has also been quite intimidating for you. Yeah. But like I said, you just have to not think about it. Just, just go. Just, just <laughs> literally just, just, just jump in. It's quite a light bulb moment for him to think, this, these could be lyrics, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It takes him a while to, to make that jump, but it's, yeah. it's, it's a great jump. Um, ben, let's talk about Varden. I mean, he, he's got this such interesting relationship with his dad. That must have been quite a, a good way in for the character for you. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And Peter was amazing. Um, very scary. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in a very fatherly way. <laughs> um, and, yeah, it's a, it's a really brilliant, classic father-son relationship, I think, that, like Paul was saying, you know, you make something more personal, it becomes more universal. And, you know, everyone's had, everyone has arguments with father figures um, and, you know, tries to figure out what that means to them. I think that was, you know, for Barden, his relationship with his dad became more about his relationship with himself um, and how to navigate that. And he doesn't want to be walked all over, but he he is nonetheless somewhat trapped, isn't he? Yeah, he doesn't really have a choice. I think, you know, that was one of the things for Barden. He's, has, you know, he's, he's stripped of the decision-making. You know, everyone says, oh, you always have a choice, good or bad, but it becomes sort of very distant for him to be able to choose between those things. And we've seen the, the close relationship with his nan. Is yeah. that going to be a catalyst? To, to oh, yeah. You know, having you know, our nan is sort of a huge heartbeat throughout the whole show, I think, with the bird song connecting all of us to that. And her, yeah, yeah she's very important. Jordan, let me bring you in as well. How would you describe the place that Gregory is in when we first meet him here? I think he's, he's pretty much in limbo. You know, he's in this place that I think on the surface is hell for most people, but for him, the life he was living before that point isn't really much different, except with that life, there's a risk of criminal charges in prison. With this one, it's it's legal. Um, but then what he has on that other side is an avenue and a route that I don't think anyone could predict for that kind of person. And I think that's what I love about the character is he's, he's complex and he's layered and he's not just black and white, what you would take him as from those first things we see. So the ride you go on with Gregory is a, it's a ride for sure. And he's very much in his own head as well, isn't it? Yeah, and I think what's really nice to find as we go through the series is the, is the links and the similarities between the brothers, even though you take them as something so different on the surface, but they really are the one thing. So yeah, I think looking at complex people and making them human and being able to relate that is is so important. So I, that's why I love being able to play Gregory. Are we going to see quite a different side of him now coming back? Yeah, I don't want to ruin nothing, but it's, it's, <laughs> really, yeah, it's different. It's very different. You can tease without ruining. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's <towards> a portal. <laughs> uh, Michelle, we, we saw a flavour. Uh, tell us, tell us more. Set the scene for us. Um, well, I mean, Estella is. At the beginning, she's kind of an outsider, really. You know, um, she's been exiled from the estate for talking too much because um, she's a struggling alcoholic. And so she doesn't, you know, she's not spending as much time with her son as she would like to, as you can see. Um, but she, you know, gradually as the, as the story goes on, she's sort of integrated much more into into the narrative um, and like she said there she's a singer so that kind of gives you a clue as to how she kind of you know gets involved but it's um 
she's an amazing character. I just loved her. And when I read the scripts for the first time, I just kind of fell in love with all of the characters in this. It's just so beautiful and relatable and, and they're a real family and you start to see that as the episodes go on. They come together. He comes, you know, when the characters all kind of begin to come home. It's just, yeah, it's just really beautiful. I just loved, loved it instantly. And so a character that you felt you could really get your teeth into as well. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, I just, you know, I just think that it was, yeah, it was instant. I just fell in love with with her and, and every character has so much heart. Um, yeah. And how invested or not do you think she might be in changing and in working on that relationship with her son and, and changing well, She's always trying. <laughs> um, but it's a struggle, you know, it's a real struggle. And, and because of the situation that she's now been put in, um, is you know she's there's a there's a kind of guilt there's so much guilt that she carries and she beats herself up for you know what she said and what she's done and so naturally that you know the drink helps um but it's a it's a challenge certainly but like you know like all of these characters it's like the music is it's it helps them in some way helps them express how they feel and Estella is the same. Karen, just as Stephen was saying, this is so much more than a show about music. There are so many strands to bring together and a certain tone to find. I mean, how much of that was the challenge of the piece? Well, it was a challenge and it was a gift. You know, we were talking earlier and I think I've seen all these episodes many, many times, but we talk quite often about the, the avenues that Steve's writing takes you. And even when you've seen the episodes multiple times, I'm still surprised by, you know, the next story strand that comes and, you know, sort of hits you in a way that is surprising. So it, whilst it is challenging um, with a, you know, with a raft of actors that we have and with sort of Paul leading them through it, it's sort of, it's been quite a joy. <laughs> I'd like to make it sound like it's been really difficult, but... Um, <laughs> quite lovely what's it been like finding this this young cast and bring them together and oh well that was um daniel our casting director who i saw very briefly here Hi there. Yes, um, <laughs> we we knew slightly terrifyingly going into this that the show would live or die based on the cast that we attached and it was it was a bit squeaky, um, <laughs> but uh, because we just didn't know if we would find people that could deliver on the level of performance that Steve's scripts require, but would then be able to perform the music that we wanted them to, because we wanted it to be done authentically. We wanted them to be the people that would sing, would perform. And, um, and I probably won't forget, I'm not trying to pick out a favorite one, but I won't forget Ben's audition because basically what we asked of our actors was to, to sort of self-tape themselves recording a song as well as, you know, um, auditioning a scene. And, you know, Paul only sends people to me and Katie and the BBC when, when you know, we're sort of further along. And, um, and when Ben sort of got his guitar out, I just thought, oh my God, I'm now watching a rock star. It was, it was sort of, I've never experienced it, but it was, it was that level that we needed to, to hit. And, um, you know, it, it was, it was, you know, it was tricky, right, Daniel? Um, and, <laughs> and, and there was a degree of, we knew we wouldn't get all Birmingham born actors. I mean, we've been really fortunate, as you can tell from the stage, you know, we have found some incredibly authentic Midlands actors, but, you know, accent was another thing that we needed to make sure we could deliver on. Um, but it was, you know, we're thrilled. I mean, I, I couldn't be more proud of this cast and, you know, the people on the stage, but everybody else as well. It's, it's been a triumph, I think. And Stephen, we've talked about the the classic music that we love, but there is going to be original music as, as well. Can you talk a little bit about can that? Can we talk a little bit about that? We can definitely talk about their songs, yes. But can we name who they are? We can, Shall I just, do you want to throw that one over to me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
you go for it. <laughs> um, so we uh, we've been amazingly fortunate in getting um, K Tempest and Dan Carey to write our five original songs for the band. Um, Paul was very clear at the outset that the music needed to come. Well, we all were, but particularly in terms of the talent that we brought in in order to deliver on those songs, that it came from character and story. And Kay was a, is Kay here? No. Um, they were able to tap into, in a way that I think blew us all away, Dante's character. You know, it, they, these songs feel like they have been written in Dante's head. Um, and Dan, the music that he wrote and produced and then got these guys to perform, you know, in a studio, we've been incredibly lucky. The bit that we can't talk about, which is why Steve's thrown it over to me, is um, through partnering with Mercury, we've been able to access some extraordinary contemporary artists who have recorded every um, closing credit song. So you'll have seen Self Esteem has recorded that track at the end of episode one. We've got artists like that throughout, but I think that's the bit we can't say. Okay, can't say that <laughs> bit, um, but there are some really cool artists and I think that news is coming out this week. It's incredibly cool. And um, something I know you will want to talk about, Stephen, this is the first production out of your Birmingham yes. studio, isn't it? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And tell me how important that is. Well, we did it before we were ready, which is always good. <laughs> Um, but no, it, it was the first first one, and you know, I, I it, it's a project that I've been working on for like eight or nine years to get a studio there. It's in Digbeth, uh, which you know, if anybody knows Birmingham, it's quite a rough bit of Birmingham, but it's quite cool as well, and there's lots going on. So, what we've got is like twenty acres of land that's got um, industrial um, warehouses and. and Victorian architecture and I love it I think it's absolutely beautiful so we've got MasterChef moving has moved into one of them and we we started doing this uh, show here lots more stuff coming but the point of the whole thing is that to do it there and to be shooting it in Birmingham for me was incredibly important because you know not a, the stuff being made there but there's been a bit of a hole in the middle of the country when it comes to shooting stuff and so it's been my uh, passion to try and change that and to see this coming out and to see things like, which, you know, I love Spaghetti Junction, I think it's beautiful. Um, and to, you know, but to, <laughs> but to see that, um, you know, on the screen just now and you know, you'll see throughout, there's there's lots, and that beautiful shot with the, of the M, there's a lot of M6 in this because <laughs> Dante is obsessed with the M6. So we see a lot of that. And I just wanted, uh, to take the bits of Birmingham that I've always thought are just amazing and great to look at and just put them on a the screen and see if anybody agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> and you said it was slightly before you were ready, but yeah, I mean, you're, yeah, yeah. you're up and running now. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we've got announcements coming about shows coming in and stuff. But this, for me, is absolutely the reason for doing Dig the Flock. I want to see John and Greg just popping up. At the yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and guys, tell me about you guys finding chemistry, getting time together. Did you get a chance to rehearse or were you thrown into it? What, what was that like for, for you? We hung out a bit, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> a bit too much. Yeah. You'd heard about his guitar and you were... Oh, yeah. It's... Oh, we played together like when we first met and went to little <laughs> open mic nights together and stuff in secret, you know, to get close and cosy. <laughs> Um, so we did a lot of bonding, but we didn't need to. You know, went into the chemistry read with him, and it was like, ah, oh, sick, cool. This is they're going to give it to us, aren't they? Surely. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Anyway, um, um, I wasn't that popular. Actually. <laughs> no, I wasn't either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. was out of there thinking, well, oh, that's it. That's good. Goodbye to. Uh, Let's do some acting for once. It was great. <laughs> um, but yeah, we we did. We we went to open mic nights. Um, uh, we did we did that we did some covers of Arctic Monkeys songs we both have a very deep love for Arctic Monkeys so yeah we did that um, and then me and George um, we had our chemistry reads um, in Daniel's office and <laughs> we actually ended up making Daniel cry well, I'm sorry to <laughs> <laughs> yeah he, sorry yeah he, he yeah we um, but we just had a really 
instant sort of um like comfortability with each other which was yeah it was um i've always wanted a big brother yeah. so like i think i just naturally <laughs> just made him my brother in those moments <laughs> like <laughs> i just like played that out yeah without ruining any of the story gregory's in a slightly different position that's what i'll say so there's kind of something that that older brother position where i'm there but i'm also not bit of a lone wolf having to do his own thing um that became quite present so the moments we did have together as a group were so beautiful and it was also something for me to look at and be like these are the people i'm working with and they're so talented of what they're bringing it's, it's a different lane but it's yeah i could really appreciate it from that position i mean i think they're going to be a band no i do I, the, the music is amazing the performances are amazing i think it's going to be it's going to be something else as well as the show did you guys listen to this kind of music when you're preparing for the characters? Is it the kind of music that you would listen to anyway? Yeah. Yeah. Yes to all. Yeah. yeah. We um we had um we had a playlist together on Spotify. I was listening to it too, today. Yeah. When I, mean, I got dressed. Yeah. <laughs> we called it the Happy Truth. Oh wait, well, well, that's <laughs> it's the name of a pub in the show. Might <laughs> be like this is the MCU. Like, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, we. <laughs> we uh we had a little playlist on spotify that we all shared and uh we just put we just threw songs into there um but yeah i, I don't know about everyone else but i, I also had like a, a, a dante playlist as well that i used which was just made up of leonard cohen and bob dylan <laughs> and that that really gets you in the zone yeah. <laughs> and michelle this is kind of music that you have a relationship with as well. yeah, yeah yeah absolutely and same it's like you know when you're playing a character set in that time and that you know that period it's um it's a kind of way to sort of feel into it like so i was listening to a lot of those songs at the time the ones that are being used in the show um but also it was just the world of like being back in the 80s that i loved like you'd spot certain i mean the production design is incredible on this but you'd spot certain things like the old fairy liquid bottles and <laughs> things mm. like that that just kind of take you right back like certainly took me right back to my childhood and and the costumes and, you know, the whole world was just, it was really fun to be part of it and seeing kind of shop windows sort of with, you know, advertising for like milk for 50p. And, <laughs> you know, it was just amazing being immersed in that time. And Estella has music in her soul as well, yeah, doesn't she? Yeah, so she's, yeah, she's a singer and um, she's, yeah, she absolutely, you know, probably could have, you know, gone on to be a great mm -hmm. singer. Um, but her relationship with alcohol, you know, stopped that <laughs> and, and other circumstances, you know. So it's great. She kind of comes back into the fold and it's her passion. And I'm going to throw out in just a minute, so have your questions ready. But Paul, given how, how all-encompassing this conversation has been, how much there is to say about this piece, what do you hope that audiences will latch onto? What do you hope that they'll be saying when they, when they see this? I just, I hope they have a good time. I hope they have fun. I mean, when, when we first read it, when I first read it, you know, I had a lot, like I said before, a lot came to me, a lot connected personally. But I think I said to you, it's just so much fun, you know, and it goes and it explores the kind of darker areas and and, and, it, and it's sort of multifaceted in, in that way. But it feels like a tremendous kind of ride. And, um, and as I say, I think there's, you know, something for everyone. It's like there is a nostalgia piece for those of us who were kind of, who remember it and were, uh, uh, and were there at the time in our sort of Harrington jackets and bowling shoes. And, um, but also, I, as I say, I think there's something very contemporary about it. I think the themes of it are something that we can all sort of relate to in terms of find that journey that we're all on about living a life that's true to who you really are. That feels like it's absolutely at the heart of it for me. And I think that's something that everybody can connect with in their own way. No, I Am didn't. I... I really didn't want to go there. I wanted this to be, you know, this is the way I think of it is this is the real world. It's what might have happened in a different circumstance. So these are different people. So they're not, they, they don't, what we did with the contemporary artists was say to them, imagine it's 1981, what would you write? And so that's that's what they've done and they've come up with some beautiful stuff, but it's not meant to be 
you know, um, the last thing I wanted to do was to make this the story of whatever band, because that, that's a different thing altogether. And, No, no, no. I mean, I was surrounded by me. I've got a couple of brothers who were musicians. One of them is a professional musician. So there's a lot of music. But the thing was, when I was growing up, and it may be the same, is that music was everywhere, not just the younger generation. Like my pe parents and uncles and aunties would have a party and everybody would turn up and everybody had their own song, which they did. Everybody did their song and the people were just singing all the time. And in pubs, people would sing and we'd go out and I'd be embarrassed because my mum and dad would get up and sing on the mic. You know, It was all about music. So the idea was not that this is my music, that's your music. Just have a laugh you know, and listen to, listen to music and sing and enjoy it. Well, there are... You know, times in the show where you see her sober and times when you see her drinking. So um, I just, yeah, I, you know, I just kind of immersed myself into it, you know, depending on what, you know, what stage she was at in, you know, when it came to her addiction. Um, uh, but I approached it in the same way that I would any other role, actually. It's, you know, it, a lot of it comes in the writing and the circumstances that the characters find themselves in. Um, and then it's just working with Paul and, you know, whoever, you know, is, I'm playing the scene with as to how I'm sort of playing her physically. Um, so, but I guess that's all I can kind of tell you as to what, what you then see of her as the show goes on. Oh God, yeah. Oh, always. I mean, I, I think that if you want to do one, you have to be th not not plan it, but to think that the, you're going to be with these people for quite a long time, and you're going to almost pay them off. In other words, find out they go on a journey. You got to get to the end, the destination. You don't quite know how many series that is, but you certainly, and, you know, if it's a one-off, then that's different. But what you want to do is, and what's good about television rather than film is that you can, I think you can have a character that's unsympathetic for a long time and then redeem them, which is great. So, you know, our villain in this, of my plan is that in the end we're going to love him. But that's the idea, is that on, with 90 minutes or two hours of a movie, you've got to get on with it. But with television, you can sort of keep it going. So, yeah, there's always uh, a thought that these characters are going to mature over quite a long period of time. Uh, yeah, always, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's weird um, writing stuff. And sometimes you write it before it's topical, <laughs> which is strange. It becomes topical. Um, with this, I mean, I think, you know, fracture and, and disruption in society and, and pessimism and all of those bleak things that we've got at the moment um, were there then. And the, my intention with this was to take all of that bleakness and then find out that it's okay, that people will make it okay if you leave them alone. So that's what this is about. It's about people who are in very, very difficult circumstances, not through any fault of their own, who find ways to get out of it. Um, and we all know what things are like at the moment. It's not great. Um, but hopefully people will watch this and think, well, at least you can have a laugh and a song, you know. I think it's incredibly short-sighted to believe that um, something like the arts and creative industries um, is a luxury, because I don't think it is. And I think that you only have to look at other places in the world to see where progress comes, improvement comes. You take it just from a very specific, simple 
place, like any city in the world, you get a rundown area. Artists move in because it's cheap. And so they start doing what they do. Then the coffee bar opens because there's artists. And then the coffee bar leads to the, the bar and the restaurant. Things start happening in that area as a consequence of artists moving in. They don't happen in an area as a consequence of estate agents moving in. They move in later. But it's the artists who go in first. And I think that it's just, it's not trying to be nice to artists. It's just understanding that it's an ecosystem where the seed goes into the soil first and then that grows. And then when that grows, other things grow around it. So it's just that the artists are first and they shouldn't be punished for that. Can keep that applause coming because that's also the end of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming to BBC One and I play very, very soon.